I invited the governor here on our behalf, collectively, because in order to foster a partnership as the largest humanitarian organization in Massachusetts and the rest of the world, it is an opportunity for us to work together with the governor representing our government and our legislature to do positive humanitarian work throughout our communities in various areas of detail. We have 4,500 Rotary Rotarians in Massachusetts, plus their families and their friends, and we are a major resource of unlimited potential. Uh, as individuals and collectively, we initiate, execute, and fund our humanitarian projects throughout the state. I'm just going to mention a few. You saw a phenomenal video done by this gentleman here. Unfortunately, the governor's time doesn't allow him to see it. But our objective is to form a partnership with him and his organization to work together to, to improve the communities. Uh, I would just like to mention a few examples. Ralph Hammond, who couldn't be here tonight, created a literacy program that is used in three countries. And we know our education system could use some work. Life skills need to be improved. Nutrition, budgeting, and citizenship, for example. Bob Cassidy, who you heard tonight with the Gift of Life program. Jimmy Marshall, who takes time and money to get iPods for veterans. Richard DeVito and Paul Sullivan, one of Richard you're going to hear later. Please don't leave after the governor. We have a lot going on. On the opiate crisis, Sandy Wilson, who's not here tonight, who started a homeless shelter for 18 to 22 year olds in Lowell after they came out of foster homes and had no place to go. Uh, and I'd like to cite Melissa Carella, who's here in the corner, a young lady who fights female sexual trafficking. And I uh, can mention one simple project that I did with the Bill Ricker Club, which is called the Aruba Raffle, which produced over $120,000 of scholarship in 30 years. And certainly last but not least, the Bedford Club, who's worked on Stop Hunger for four consecutive years with volunteers and has funded and packed 250,000 meals for the homeless, not only overseas, but in this country. And with that, I would like to present you with our popular governor, but one request before you get to speak, governor, and that is in your present term or your next term or your future higher terms. <laughs> I would suggest that you consider appointing Gino Fratelloni, <laughs> who, who, I've, who I've named the Roving Rotarian because he goes to six or seven clubs a week, as your ambassador to the Italian community wherever. <laughs> So John says he has some. John says he has some questions from the crowd. So I'm going to ask each table that uh, put the question out for the governor to please stand. And the first question fits the theme of the night. How would you like to see Massachusetts Rotary Clubs get involved in their initiatives to stem the opiate ap epidemic? And what table did that? That was our table. Please. So um, first of all, it's a great question. Um, so this has been obviously a big issue for us. It's been a big issue for our colleagues in the legislature, and it's been, been a big issue for families around the Commonwealth. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend a few minutes on this one, if you don't mind. Um, John, you should probably take a seat. Um, <laughs> so my, uh, my career, as most people know, is in the healthcare space, OK? And that's really kind of where I spent most of my time. I was Health and Human Service Secretary under Governor, uh, Governor Weld and Lieutenant Governor Salucci. I ran a medical group called Harvard Vanguard Medical Associates. I was the CEO of Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare for about 10 years. And I also spent a lot of time um, consulting before uh, I worked in the Weld Salucci administration, mostly with healthcare organizations. And, um, and I worked for a venture capital firm uh, after I left Harvard Pilgrim, that was also all about healthcare. So I feel like I know a thing or two about healthcare. Okay, we have two boys, my wife and I, uh, and a daughter. 
our two boys are both out of college. Uh, the oldest is 26, the next is 23. Um, and when the oldest was a senior in college, which was four or five years ago, he was one of the co-captains of the football team uh, at the college that he went to. And he got hurt several times during his senior year. Um, but he wanted to play because it was his senior year and he was co-captain and this was it for him in football. And then in the last game of the season, after sort of muddling through a whole series of injuries, he uh, broke his foot. And he broke it in such a way that they had to install a bunch of pins in it, and the pins were in it for a long period of time, and um, the recovery took forever. And he literally was on a scooter until about three weeks before graduation. So think about that. Last football game is around Thanksgiving. Um, this kid was kind of laid up after he had his surgery all the way through the winter and into the spring. And over that period of time, um, I said that I thought he probably took about 100 Oxycontin. My wife said, no, 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 way more than that, way more than that. Um, now, I'm a healthcare guy. I didn't appreciate the downside and the addictive consequences associated with this. And no one, no one who wrote those prescriptions for our son said anything to him or to us about the downsides associated with prolonged use of this stuff. So let's go forward a few years. By the way, this is kind of the retrospective piece. This all just happened, and life went on for the Baker family. By some miracle, for whatever reason, it just didn't stick with our son. So now it's 2014, I'm running for governor, and, um, and everywhere I go, somebody's coming up to me afterwards and saying, you got a minute? You're, you're a healthcare guy, right? So I got this friend. And then they tell me some story about their friend that involved addiction and opioids. And I literally heard it everywhere I went. Didn't matter what part of Massachusetts I was in, what community I was in. Didn't matter how many people were in the room. I mean, literally, if there were 10 people in the room, someone was coming up to me afterwards and asking me about this. So after a while, I just started bringing it up as part of my remarks. And saying, well, of course, the one of the issues we need to deal with is, is this issue around opioids and addiction. Mostly trying to see if I get some sort of an echo out of the crowd as a result of bringing it up in my comments. And then people started coming up to me afterwards and saying, it wasn't about a friend anymore. They came up and they said, I got a son, I got a daughter, I got a husband, I got a wife. I got a mom, I got a dad. I got a coworker, a boss, a neighbor. And every single person I talked to said, and it's been hell. Hell. And then they would define for me their definition of hell. And in some cases, somebody died. In some cases, somebody was in recovery and everybody's fingers were crossed because at any minute they might lapse. And some people were literally right in the throes of just an unbelievable and brutal battle. And this, again, it was just happening everywhere I went. So I finally said to one of the people on the campaign, I could just be listening for this, but it sure sounds to me like there's something big going on out here. So could you Google this thing and just see what comes up? So a couple days later, they come into my, um, my little office at the campaign and they say, yeah, there's a, there's a real issue here. A whole bunch of statistics that basically showed that um, since about 2005, when people really started to prescribe this stuff in a big way, prescriptions, overdoses, and deaths literally just straight lines with one another. Prescriptions this line, overdoses this line, deaths this line, right? But all heading in exactly the same direction, straight up. And they said, by the way, 66% of everybody who gets admitted to a hospital gets an opioid prescription. 18% of those 
are still on it a year later, and 8% of those have a problem. Now, 8% of 66% may not sound like a big number, except if you think about the number of people who get admitted to a hospital every day, that's a really big number. So then we started talking about it a lot during the campaign. And I went to visit some folks. Are there any uh, folks who work in hospitals here? So I went to visit a couple of hospitals that I knew well, and I went to talk to folks in the ER. Because I figured that would be sort of the front door for a lot of this stuff. They said, oh yeah, God, it's brutal. It's just everywhere. And I said, so why am I telling you about it? Why aren't you telling me? You know, why haven't you sort of raised this issue? And they said, well, you know, truthfully, we're just trying to deal with it. We're just trying to deal with it. And it's not really an issue anybody wants to talk about. So from that point on, I talked about it a lot. And then in the last week of the campaign, the Sunday, Saturday before the election, my wife and I are barnstorming around the Commonwealth. And our second son, who also played football in college, was playing for Union against Hobart at Hobart, which is in Geneva, New York. Phone rings in the car. It's our son on the other end of the line. And he says, Mom, I'm on the way to the hospital. I just broke my arm in two places um, during the football game. I don't know what's going to happen, but I wanted to call. And so we have the big debate about whether we should just blow off the campaign and just drive straight to Geneva, which for those of you who have driven to Geneva, it's wicked far. <laughs> um, and if there's anything we can do about it, right? So then about 20 minutes later, before we make the decision that we're going to drive to Geneva, the coach calls and says, I'm with him at the hospital. Uh, they, don't, they just want to sort of set him here, but they want to get him back to, back to Schenectady because he's going to require surgery. We'd rather have the surgery done someplace close to where the rehab's going to be. So, uh, so don't come, basically, was the message. So my wife and I, our antennas now about pain meds are like through the moon, which they never were before. And the guilt that we felt about the way we incredibly poorly handled our older son, and by some grace of God, didn't end up where so many other people did. It's like, what do we do? So my wife gets on the horn with him later in the day and says, please, do everything you possibly can to stay away from whatever kind of pain meds they offer you. And he was a good kid about it. He took a few, and then gritted his teeth and took Tylenol and ibuprofen from that point forward. But the difference in the way we dealt with this, because we knew the downside issues associated with this, was completely different than the way we dealt with it with our oldest. And I told this story to some folks in the media after we won the election. And I said, I'm going to make this a big issue. We need to talk about this. We need to make it comfortable for people to talk about it. And we've got to get real about the fact that there's just too much of this stuff floating around, period. And so that then led to a task force that made 55 recommendations, four pieces of legislation, Folks who are here from the legislature. I saw Senator Lewis, Representative. Who else? Do we have other folks in the legislature? Your police representation, the back. Police, folks in the healthcare community, including a limit on first prescriptions, seven days, and a whole host of other initiatives around prevention, education, treatment, and recovery. And a lot of the prevention and education is directed toward parents, athletes, coaches, kids, teachers. Finally got core curriculum required to graduate from medical school, dental school, nursing school in Massachusetts around opioid therapy and pain management. Because most people have been graduating forever from nursing, dental, medical school without ever taking a course in opioid therapy or pain management. 
baked it into the continuing education requirements for prescribers, souped up the prescription monitoring program, put a ton of money into treatment and recovery, created a certification program for our sober houses. I mean, literally just went at this from as many different angles as we possibly could with the help and support of a lot of the folks in the legislature. We have the right set of tools in the toolbox, but we're still dealing with something that's got a trend line on it that's just outrageous. And we managed to get 46 other governors to sign off on a blueprint that looks a lot like what we did in Massachusetts because this is not just an issue here, it's an issue all over the country. So my short answer to John's question, <laughs> there's a huge issue here around knowledge and education. Huge. The more you can do to communicate to your colleagues, no matter what field they're in, about the fact that there's nothing wrong with pain medication, and in certain circumstances and situations, especially around managing chronic pain, it's a critical element in people's ability to actually live a semi-normal existence. But when it comes to acute incidents, <coughs> wisdom teeth, sprained ankles, broken fingers, all that kind of stuff, people should not be walking out the door with 30, 40, 50, 60 of these things. They just shouldn't. Anybody here in the real, the real estate business? When I say real estate, I mean like realtors. So we did an event with the realty community um, last spring where we said, make sure if you have this kind of medication around your house, then you take it down to the police station, or now you can take it to Walgreens because they have take back boxes, um, or you destroy this stuff because people are now showing up at open houses so they can rifle their way through your drawers and your medicine chests to steal whatever kind of medication you might have lying around. And in Massachusetts last year, in Massachusetts last year, prescribers wrote four million pain med prescriptions worth over 200 million pills for a state that has six million people, most of whom are healthy. So we have a ton of work to do on this one. But the biggest thing Rotarians can do to help, the biggest thing you can do, is help people understand that there is a real downside to this stuff, and it's real, and it needs to be managed, and it needs to be considered when folks make decisions about this. Particularly if you're talking about short-term pain, and first prescriptions, and acute episodes. Because we still have tons of work to do to help people understand what the consequences are of not appreciating this. And again, we had tremendous help from the legislature on this. They've been wonderful partners. And, uh, and the fact that we got 46 other states to basically sign up to do what we've already done here in Massachusetts, I think speaks to the fact that on this particular issue, we're leading the charge. And, uh, and I couldn't be prouder to be part of that bipartisan coalition. Thank you. That was a wicked long answer. Well, bring your attention what we want to do to partner yeah. with you. Yeah. And as Rotary is committed to helping you on that, and that is the reason why we invited you here tonight, and that's just one example of what we do. Hoorah! Yeah. Just a couple more questions as time permits. Uh, here's one. Uh, charter schools, where you recognize, recognize your support of charter school expansion. While most people support innovation in public education, many public school teachers and administrators and parents are concerned that charter schools take funding from regular public schools. Can you understand this concern in if the funding follows the child? That's from the Worcester Club. Worcester Club, yeah. please stand up. Yeah. The, um, so, um, charter schools represent about 4% of the kids who are educated in Massachusetts, and they spend about 4% of the money. Um, they uh, operate almost exclusively in cities because they serve primarily um, kids who live in uh, school districts that are underperforming, not all, but many. 
Um, the last time a charter school got approved by the Commonwealth that wasn't in a city was in the 1990s, okay? I mean, for the most part, these schools are serving kids from communities of color, mostly in cities, and most of them are in school districts that have them getting the job done on behalf of the kids in that community. Now, for me, this one's pretty simple. We have 20 years of experience with this. This isn't a new idea. It's been studied over and over and over again by all kinds of organizations. Stanford, Harvard, the Boston Foundation, the Brookings Institution, the Mass Taxpayers Foundation, Harvard School of Education. And they all basically said the same thing, which is the kids who are served in these schools do dramatically better than they did or that others do in the rest of the schools in their district. Now, skip the fact that I'm a governor. I'm a son and a parent. I never worried about whether or not I was going to get a great education when I was a kid. Because my parents chose to live in a school district in Needham that had terrific public schools. And as a parent, I'm incredibly proud of the fact that the public schools in Massachusetts, for the most part, are as good as you're going to find anywhere in the country. I mean, literally, for the last six years, Massachusetts kids, as a direct result of teachers and families and administrators and others, finished number one in the country on the Math and English National Education Assessment Exam. And we're the only state that's ever finished number one in the country in both math and English, and Massachusetts has done it six times in a row. We also have the single biggest gap anywhere in the country between white students and students of color. And the only thing that has closed that gap is charter schools. Charter schools, for the most part, serve kids in communities of color. And those kids on the eighth grade MCAS and the high school MCAS score as high or outperform their counterparts in white school districts. As a parent, okay, as a parent, it kills me that there are 32,000 kids on waiting lists in Massachusetts to get into a charter school, especially because most of those kids are the neighbors of the kids who do go to charter schools. Now, the Brookings Institution, Manhattan Institute, Mass Taxpayers Foundation, this funding question has been studied. Mass Taxpayers Foundation report, I think, is coming out tomorrow. And they all say the same thing. Charter schools do not take resources from regular schools. The funding formula works exactly the same way it does for vocational and technical schools. The dollars follow the kid, except that unlike the Voc Tech schools, it's seven o'clock. Thank you. <laughs> unlike the Voc Tech schools, where the dollar follows the kid and the community just writes the check to the Voc Tech school, there's a ramp down associated with charter schools in which you fund the district twice for all intents and purposes for several years to represent a percent associated with the funding that follows the kid when the kid moves into a charter school. The kids in charter schools come off a lottery. The ball bounces and maybe you get in and maybe you don't. And remember, we're talking about 4% of the kids in Massachusetts who are in charter schools. 4% of the money. 
This ballot question, let's suppose all of the kids on the waiting list, which would take forever, by the way, if this ballot question passes, let's suppose all of them got into public charter schools. Then you'd be talking about 6% of the kids in Massachusetts. And we'd be spending 6% of the money. And almost all of that activity would be taking place in school districts where these schools have proven to be hugely important to parents in the education of their children. Now I get the fact that this is a contentious issue. And I could have very easily chosen not to get involved in it. But when you're standing on somebody's porch and they're crying to you about the fact that their son got into Brook, which is a charter school in Boston, but their daughter, even though there's a sibling preference, didn't. We're supposed to be the education state. Public education started here. We're supposed to be all about opportunity and equality. We're supposed to be about making sure that everybody gets the same chance. I get the fact that it's an uncomfortable issue for a lot of folks in the communities where charter schools operate. But for me, this one's about those 32,000 families and the opportunity they don't get if we don't lift the cap. And again, I remind you, if we lift the cap and all 32,000 of those kids find their way into a public charter school, you're talking about 6% of the kids in Massachusetts and 6% of the money. Tough issue for a lot of folks in education, I get that. But it's not fair. It's not fair to those kids and their families who aren't getting the same education that a lot of the rest of us got. And that's why I'm on this issue. And the voters will make the call as they should. I'm a big believer in direct democracy. Always have been. And I sure hope you all vote against the marijuana question, <laughs> which is number four. There are important social services for elders and veterans needs are also important. However, how do you plan to determine how to fund all those equally important initiatives? And that's a common theme from many of the tables here tonight. Um, so Massachusetts, just FYI, has the best veteran services program in the country. All right? Everybody says that. Um, we're the only state in the country that has a veterans officer in every community. We're the only state in the country that has an um, automatic payment to people when they come back uh, to the Commonwealth after service. Um, we, we, we should be enormously proud of the fact that when it comes to delivering for vets, there's nobody like Massachusetts. It's one of the things you should all be enormously proud of. Um, we have also signed legislation and continued to press to reduce homelessness for veterans. And it's my view um, that if we continue on the current track we're on, uh, we probably will be able to eliminate homelessness for vets in the Commonwealth of Mass in the next few years, which would be a huge win, again, for the Commonwealth. Um, was that seniors or social service or both? Which was the other piece? And veterans and seniors. Seniors. Um, we have uh, some of the most significant um, programs for seniors as well. We're one of the few states that has a pretty broad and pretty expansive home care program that's not associated with um, the Mass Health or the Medicaid program or the Medicare program. And we also are one of the few states that basically applies every available federal resource uh, to provide support services to seniors in the community. And as a result, um, 
we have seen, as the population has gotten older, okay, over the course of the past 10 or 15 years, we've actually seen a decline in the number of seniors uh, who are being served in nursing homes. And the reason for that is over that same period of time, um, we've done a much better job of helping uh, folks stay independent, stay in the community, age in place, and that has always been um, sort of the core of Massachusetts strategy dating all the way back to when I worked for Bill Weldon Paul Salucci. When, when I was in state government in the 90s, we were told that if you just looked at the trend on uh, the aging of the population, we were going to need 6,000 more nursing home beds uh, to meet that demand. And we basically took exactly the opposite approach and said, well, what we need to do is do a better job of supporting seniors in the community so that they can stay in the community longer, stay in their home longer, and not have to go uh, into a nursing home, and unless and until they absolutely positively have to. And not only did we not build the 6,000 nursing home beds, but we're actually using fewer beds today, some 20 years later, than we were using back then. And that's with a much more significant over 65 population than we had at that point in time. Please share your position on college funding and making higher education affordable. So, boy, this is just one softball after another. Um, so, last year we announced a program um, that's called the, Co the Commonwealth Commitment, and it basically uh, provides, it's the first time ever that the community colleges, the state universities, and UMass have all agreed that kids who follow a particular course, a uh, set of coursework, um, can transfer easily from one school to the next. And if you start at a community college under this program, um, after two years you can transfer with full credit uh, to a state university or to UMass. And the total cost before grants and scholarships for a four-year degree under this program is about 30 grand. That's before, that's before, um, it's called the Commonwealth Commitment. You should Google it, it's on this, uh, the higher ed website. Um, but it's the first time we've ever been able uh, to get everybody to row in the same direction so that the courses uh, for certain majors, and these are typically majors where we think there's gonna be a job at the end of the process for people. Uh, but it's a pretty broad set of opportunities. Kids who pursue this um, are gonna be able to get before Remember, before grants and scholarships, um, you can get a four-year degree from UMass, 30 grand. Um, we think this is, could be a game changer for a lot of folks and a lot of kids. And the, the two other things I would say, I'm a big believer in doing more with uh, online education than we've been doing. And there's a lot of possibilities and a lot of opportunities there. And part of the reason I like it is it makes it possible for people to take courses when they can take them. If you're working or you have kids or both, um, arranging your life around when you have to be in a class is incredibly difficult. And we should be able to think about how we make this possible for people to take a class and take a course when they are available to take it, which may be 8.30 at night or noon on a Saturday or whenever it happens to be. And one of the great things about online education, particularly as it continues to develop, is it's getting smarter and smarter about how to make that possible for people. Um, the other thing I would say uh, with respect to this question is, I talk to a lot of people all the time who say, you know, I'd love to be able to advance in my company, but I don't have time to get a four-year degree. I just don't. Um, I don't have time to get an associate's degree. But if I could just get smarter about project management, about leadership, about organizational development, about how to read a balance sheet and an income statement, how to manage a budget, um, I could get a promotion. And that I could do. And so one of the things I'm hoping happens, um, and I say this as an employer, I mean, I would love for the Commonwealth to be able to pay for people to take these kinds of things and get the competency certification that's associated with this, which they can do while they work, raise a family and do all the other things people do um, so that they can move forward. I mean, 
there are people all over the place who are working who could be promoted, but there's a small skill set that they don't have credentials on. And the way the job description is currently written, you know, bachelor's required. Well, somebody's been doing a certain job and working their way up the food chain for 15 years. I'm sorry, they're probably smarter than anybody about how to do that job than somebody who has a bachelor's. And we need, to, we need to make that kind of stuff available for people so that they can, you know, fit that in with all the other things they're doing in their life. And I've talked to a bunch of folks in the, you know, my dad taught at Northeastern for a long time. And I watched that co-op program. And that thing is just magnificent. Um, and I've always wondered why we don't do more of that. Uh, in public higher ed. And I've kind of put that one out to the folks at UMass and the folks in, in uh, the state university system and said, folks, we should, we should do more of this. Um, because it really creates possibility for a lot of kids. And it also dramatically reduces the cost of getting an education. Because they're working while they're getting the education, they're getting paid, and it's creating this learn while you learn opportunity for them that they can then put to use when they graduate. I'm going to lighten it up a little bit here. You mentioned the softball question. Are you going to do anything for Big Poppy on it when he retires? Yes. The answer to that is yes. And tune in on Sunday. We actually have something really cool in mind for Big Poppy. Oh, thank you. Governor, what would you say is your greatest accomplishment so far as a governor, and the follow-up, and then what is your greatest goal that you want to accomplish? Uh, biggest accomplishment would be, I think we have a really great team. Um, I'm a big believer that teams are what ultimately determines success in most organizations. Um, we have great people working across our administration, and um, and I've had a lot of people tell me, and I've had the LG, the Lieutenant Governor, Karen Polito, has had a lot of people tell her that they think we have a great team. And when you're talking about an organization with 40,000 employees, um, which is the executive branch of government, and $40 billion in spending, um, it's not about Karen Polito, it's not about me, it's about the team. If you don't have a great team, you're never going to get anything done. And I think we have a great team. And that great team has made it possible for us to get a bunch of stuff done. Um, it's made it possible for us um, to continue to be able uh, to invest in our cities and towns. Great teams most of the time is where, uh, is where opportunity starts. And I think if I think about um, the municipal modernization bill we got passed, I know that sounds like weed whacking and it is, except that it cleaned up, two, it cleaned up about 50 years worth of goo that existed between state government and local government made it a lot harder for local government to do its job. Every municipal official I've talked to has said this is a game changer for them with respect to their ability to do their job. Um, some of the reforms we're chasing at the MBTA, um, which is a very tough issue and a very big problem, but it's something that desperately needed to happen. Um, I, I just give you two really simple stories. The first is um, state buys a lot of stuff, the T buys a lot of stuff, right? Until we took office, the T had never had a conversation with the state about whether the state got a better deal on a lot of the stuff the state buys than the T got. All right? Because the T can buy off the state's blankets. And if the state has better prices, the T can access those. A lot of cities and towns use the state's blankets for stuff. Well, it turns out that the state actually gets a better price than the T does on almost everything that the state buys that the T buys too. Um, so the, the T is literally saving millions of dollars because they are now buying stuff off the state's contracts. Now there's two advantages to that. The first is they save money by really not changing a heck of a lot at all. And the second is they no longer have to worry about focusing on buying all that stuff or managing all those contracts and they can focus instead on the stuff that they do buy that the state doesn't buy that's typical and traditional for an organization like that. Um, the second thing the T just really didn't invest a lot of money in what I would call the core underbelly of the operation. Signals, switches, tracks, systems. Um, a lot of the signals are 100 years old. I mean, no kidding, they were installed in like 1915. I have the photos to prove it. 
Um, and, um, and it's a completely mechanically based system, which means that it doesn't have the ability to actually move as many trains as one would like it to be able to move through the system because when you run a mechanical system, there's a limit to how close together the trains can get. Um, so new trains, new signals, new switches, digitizing this stuff, we'll be able to move twice as many trains through the system at the same period of time. Now think about that. If, if we currently can only move five trains every 30 minutes at rush hour through the system, think about what a difference it would make if we could move 10. I mean, you're basically talking about doubling your capacity um, within the same time frame as we have now. Um, the, the T is going to be sort of a very long-term project, but it's a billion dollars of your money, whether you ride it or not, that you spend every year. It's a, it's a billion dollars, okay? It's real money, and, um, and it serves a million people. And it's one of the primary vehicles through which folks from the Merrimack Valley all the way to Worcester and all the way down into the southeastern part of the Commonwealth get to and from work, school, and a whole bunch of other things. And it deserves and needs the focus and the attention that it's currently getting. Um, the opioid stuff I already talked about. I'm incredibly proud of the work we're doing there. Um, I really do want to defeat question four. I'm just going to repeat that one again, which is the <laughs> marijuana one. Recreational marijuana is not the same as smoking a joint, okay? It's a collection of hundreds thousands of products that look exactly like their traditional commercial equivalents. Cookies, soda, wine, gummy bears, donuts, I mean, the all day suckers, lollipops, the list, candy bars, the list just goes on and on and on and on and on. And there are more dispensaries in Denver where this is passed than there are Starbucks and McDonald's put together. Um, it's, it's the corporatization of recreational marijuana and I am tremendously concerned about the consequences of this for kids. Um, I know I sound like an old fogey when I say that, but Jason Lewis, who, who isn't he, is Jason still here and he leave? Okay. Senator from Winchester led a delegation that went out to Colorado on the ground, spent a week out there talking to everybody under the sun, healthcare people, educators, uh, people in uh, state government, people in local government, came back and wrote a 100-page report about all the things that are problematic about what's going on in Colorado on the ground and said, I went out there kind of predisposed to support legalization and I came back virulently opposed. Um, and nobody's had a better look at what this looks like on the ground than he has. And, uh, and I really appreciate his willingness to work hard on this one as part of the No One Four campaign. In terms of going forward, the biggest thing for me, I'm a former local official, okay? So is Karen Polito. So are a whole bunch of people who work in our administration. The Commonwealth of Mass is a collection of 351 cities and towns. How people feel about how things are going are ultimately a function of how they feel about how things are going in their neighborhood, in their community. That's how people, and in their region, that's how people make decisions about how they think things are going. My goal is to be able to say at the end of our term, whenever that is, that wherever you live in Massachusetts, whatever region you're in, whatever community you're in, you really feel like we are heading in the right direction and things are positive and getting better. People are working, parks are good, kids have good places to go to school. There's kind of a positive sense about how things are going. I mean, a lot of people talk about, you know, how there's kind of the state, right? I don't think about it that way. I think we're an accumulation of 351 cities and towns, and the way I make decisions and the way I think about how things are going are absolutely a function about how I think, how people feel about how things are going in their community. And that's one of the reasons why our economic development bill is so focused on what goes on west of 128 and north of 128 and south of 128. 
because that's really where we believe the opportunity to create momentum and positive movement is. The inside 128 stuff, they're rocking, okay? They don't, they don't need a lot of help from us. We just gotta make sure we don't get in the way and screw it up. <laughs> but if we're gonna be a great state, folks, it can't just be about what goes on inside 128. It's gotta be great everywhere. And that means we need to be willing and able to make the sort of investments and to provide the sort of assistance and the support across the Commonwealth so that everybody, no matter where you live, really feels like things are heading in the right direction. That's what we're looking for. Rotary is the largest humanitarian group in the world. What can we do to help you make Massachusetts great? <laughs> yeah, I actually think he stole my uh, he stole my slogan. My slogan was "Let's make Massachusetts great." That was my slogan when we ran. Um, the um, look, I would say, I, I would go back to the way I just answered that previous question. Okay, your your greatest capacity to make a difference in Massachusetts is where you work and where you live, okay? And whether you're talking about the opioid issue or you're talking about, um, I mean, every time I've been asked to serve on practically anything in Swampscott, which is where my wife and I live, I said <laughs> yes, and so did my wife. And, you know, so we've done everything from, you know, serve on the search committee for the town manager to serve on the search committee for the high school basketball coach, to coach the, um, to coach and run the local soccer program, to serve as the registrar of the soccer program, to participate in the Charter Change Commission. I mean, I, I'm a big believer that um, great communities, most of the time, have a really involved collection of adults, all right, who believe in their community and who invest in it, both here, okay, and here, and, um, and support what's going on there. And I. I really do believe that your great strength as Rotarians is in your relationships, your network, your intelligence, your experience, and your enterprising nature to support stuff that's going on closest to your home. Um, look, I think on this opioid thing, just to go there, every time you help somebody understand, and this is a good list of things you've got here, all right? Every time you help people understand this, coaches, parents, Kids, young adults, docs, nurses, the works, that's a benefit. And I think the, I really do believe your greatest opportunity, um, share what's working in your communities with one another so that people can chase best practices. That's something we're doing with the Commonwealth cities and towns right now. Um, and, and, and you're obviously involved or you wouldn't be here, right? Just stay involved in what goes on in your communities and make them great because, frankly, you're far more likely um, to know what your community uh, is all about and where your opportunities to build on the strengths you already have are going to come from, right? No, I, um, I really I'm appreciate the chance to be here um, and I very much appreciate the work uh, that you all do as Rotarians and as leaders in your communities and I, I do want you to I'm just going to reiterate this notion about, you know, the Commonwealth is nothing but uh, the strength of its communities. And um, I really, I believe that deeply because um, I've been all over Massachusetts and we have some great communities and we have some communities that, that need work. And as far as I'm concerned, until we get to the point where they're all great, um, we're truly not a great Commonwealth. And that's the way I wish, I wish everybody would think about it. And you are the kinds of people. Um, you are the leaders and the joiners and the doers uh, in your communities, and you're the kinds of folks uh, who can move your own communities forward. And I wish, um, I wish all of you um, have an opportunity uh, to do and deliver your very best to the folks in your, in your local communities. Thank you.